Hi gang, today we are going to look at the eight key plastics manufacturing processes, four that we tend to do in school and four that are more commercial as well as one little bonus one at the end. Now today's lesson is going to be pretty video heavy. Now each video is not long, it's only between sort of one and a half and uh, maybe at most five minutes, but they are required watching. So please make sure that you are allowing yourself enough time for this particular lesson at home. And then we will uh, go ahead and make some notes afterwards on each concept. OK, let's get to it. We're going to start with the one that we all know and love. It's laser cutting. Good video. OK, let's make some notes. So before we get into it, you should know that laser is in fact an acronym, if you didn't know this, for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. There you go, little fact for you. Now what happens is that a fine beam burns through paper, board, plastic. Sometimes it can be done on metal, although that's much more commercial. We don't tend to do that in school. Now a CNC, that stands for Computer Numerical Controlled, a CNC machine programmed with the correct dimensions, power settings, feed rate, that's speed, that's depth, uh, from a CAD drawing is taken. Here's one for a little sliding box that I made on 2D design. Now laser cutting is highly accurate and precise with a tiny, tiny tolerance, only the width of the beam, which is about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimetres wide. So not everything will fit together absolutely perfectly, but for the purposes of making stuff in school, it's really very good. It can create highly intricate, detailed work and have pieces fit together really, really well, even making things like cogs for machinery in school. You can also create something called a living hinge, which is one of my personal favourites. So you're basically turning a flat piece of material into a curve for things like these lamps and uh, little sort of cases. The only downside of laser cutting really is that you do have to be fairly skilled to actually work it. Obviously the machinery is very expensive to buy initially and it can be somewhat costly to maintain with things like extraction as well. Next up we've got the easiest of the lot and it's line bending. Give this one a watch. Nice one. Okay let's make some notes. So in line bending a thermoforming plastic, such as Fomex and acrylic, they tend to be the ones we use in school, can be bent using a strip heater, which contains a hot metal wire. Right, so this whole setup is called a line bender. So the hot metal wire is uh, sort of supported inside a frame uh, to obviously make sure that you're not going to burn yourself. You lay the thermoplastic sheet over the top, and just that metal wire will just heat up one small area so that you can bend it um, at an angle. Could be 90 degrees, 45 degrees could be something else. Now you can also use jigs, not like a little dance that you could do, but a jig is like a, a setup that you can put the material into over and over and over so that you can get the same shape, the same same angle for instance, um, and uh, as the acrylic cools. So you could make little things like this. And next up is vacuum forming. So give this one a watch. Okay, cool. Here we go. So in vacuum forming, High impact polystyrene or HIPS or polyvinyl chloride, PVC, tend to be the materials we use in vacuum forming because they heat up nice and quickly from their sheet. And here's some examples of the sheet with a, a little sort of shape over the top. So in each case, you have a mould or former. They're usually made of something like MDF or plywood. So different names for the same kind of thing. Now, these have a graft angle. If you think back to when you were a kid, and you were sitting at the seaside uh, with a sand castle bucket, kind of like this one. Now, in this case, you can see it's, it's not really obvious, but from the top to the bottom, there is a taper, right? There's a little angle there. It's only by a few degrees, but this draft angle helps the sand, so it helps the bucket to come off the sand, but in vacuum forming will help the uh, plastic to come off of the former. Okay, so here's an ex exaggerated example so this is obviously completely flush and this is with a draft angle. Now let's look at the process. So in vacuum forming, the mould or former is placed onto a platen, right? so like a name for a plate or a bed, and it's lowered into the actual cavity of the vacuum former. Next, a large heater uh, actually warms the plastic my plastic until it becomes flexible so it starts to dip down a little bit. 
After that, the platen and the, or, and the former in combined are raised up into the plastic sheet and sometimes they actually inject air into it as well. And then what happens is the once it's up into the plastic sheet, the vacuum is turned on, removes all of the air from around the former, and then you are left with a solid plastic form. Now that is taken out, it's allowed to cool. The flashing, that's the sort of the excess around the edge is taken off before um, sort of adding designs to it. And just to show you really quickly at commercial level, um, here is an example for you. Look at that, amazing. So this is making commercial luggage using vacuum forming. Love this. Okay, so up next is this video on 3D printing. 3D printing, it's known as an additive process. So it's really important to make a note. So literally the addition of something. So this additive process follows a CAD design and builds layers into build up complex shapes. So what happens is that a filament, so that's like a long string, right? A filament of plastic ABS or PLA is fed into the machine and heated at the nozzle end. So it becomes in to it becomes liquid sort of soft and sticks to the previous layer, that additive process. And you can see down at the bottom here that it's um, pretty much always, um, it, you know, it's very, very rarely a solid shape. It's almost always a sort of grid, um, sort of an open matrix. So it's really strong, but really lightweight and doesn't use too much material. So the advantages of 3D printing is that you don't need a mould or a former, like in vacuum forming, for instance. Alterations can be made digitally, so you're not having to waste materials. It uses sort of hard wearing, waterproof and lightweight plastics. And you can create really complex shapes. That's definitely one of its main advantages. Disadvantages, it's pretty expensive, although the costs are coming down and you do have to maintain it as well. You do need, um, you know, so it's sort of a curve, a bit of a learning curve with it, so training is needed. Um, it's currently somewhat limited in terms of materials, although if you're interested, you can go and Google um, building houses by 3D printing concrete, which is really cool. And they're also trying to experiment with actually building sort of human body parts as well. Uh, and the layering process is really currently quite slow. You know, compared to other things, it's not slow, but it does take, you know, eight to 24 hours for a relatively small part. So it does take a while. Great stuff. Next, we have injection molding. Now, this video is quite long, so I've broken it down into two much shorter sections. So the first one, please watch to one minute 44. And here's the next section for you. Just watch to seven minutes and two seconds. Awesome. I hope that was really clear. Now let's just go through to summarize. So in injection molding, plastic granules are fed from a hopper, that's the container up the top, into a barrel and heated until molten. Next, a motorized Archimedean screw pushes the molten plastic towards the mold and then it's actually injected. So it's sort of, uh, so the screw actually rams forward, right? Uh, and it's injected into a mold or die cavity under high pressure before uh, cooling um, fairly instantaneously, uh, usually in the die, uh, and then solidifies and then it's expelled using ejector pins. So injection molding is used in industry to produce most mass produced polymer parts. So if you can if you can think about it, you can imagine it, it's probably injection molded. There are ways to identify if it has been injection molded. So if you flip these little products over, you'll see a few things. First of all, are the ejector pin witness marks, like he was explaining in the video. So little circular points where it's been pushed out of the mold. And then you'll also tend to see a parting line, right? So from the seam of the die, the two halves of the die around the perimeter of the product. Next up is extrusion molding, which is a lot like injection molding. This is a very cool video. Clever, right? Okay, let's get to it. So in extrusion molding, it works in a really similar way to injection molding. You can see here from the diagram, it looks almost the same. So in the same case, uh, case as before, the granular plastic is held in a hopper, moved into an Archimedean screw along a heated chamber. Now at this time, once it's melted, instead of being pushed into a solid, solid die, it's pushed through a die mold 
and takes the form of the shape of the extrusion. So it really is just like when you play with Play-Doh when you were a kid and you had one of these little toys. It depends on whatever shape it's going to take up and you push it through. So the molten plastic is fed through the die continuously and is useful for your creating longer products. The kind of products that tend to be extruded are things like PVC guttering and PVC pipes. Also things like shelving, right? Um, and panelling faces, this kind of stuff. Next up is my favourite, which is blow moulding. So in blow moulding, it's used to shape plastics. So for instance, bottles, jars, barrels and similar shapes. So if it's not injection moulded, it's probably blow moulded. So a tube of softened plastic called a parison is extruded into a die. So the parison is inserted into the die and that and the, the die of a mould is then clamped shut. Air is blown into the parison uh, and it expands to fill the mould. The finished product is cooled and released and any flashing top or bottom is cut off. That simple. Really, really clever. We have a few ways of joining plastics together. The way we tend to do it in school is through the use of adhesives. So of course adhere to, to glue to stick together, right? So adhesives kind of glues. So we tend to use things like solvent cement, also known as acrylic cement um, in school. We can also use stuff like epoxy resin, right? A two part resin, which will go off hard. You can also use cyanoacrylate, also known as super glue. The commercial process tends to be something called plastic welding. So welding is a combination of high heat and welding rods. In this case, it's plastic welding rods rather than metal, which we tend to think about. And it looks like this. So I have a little video for you to help you out. Go. Okay, this one's great and really quick, so give it a watch. So now we've gone through the main commercial processes. Let's talk about finishing plastics. OK, so from the video we saw, to begin with, if we are working on a piece of plastic, we want to try and uh, file the edge to shape it down. And then we tend to scrape it as well. Now, that's going to produce a lot of scratch marks. From there, we want to use abrasive paper, maybe wet and dry paper in order to essentially uh, work up through the uh, through the grit ladder. So this is the, the term. Uh, for the for the number. So the lower the number, the more coarse the grip, the higher the number, the finer the grip. So we're basically removing the uh, each set of scratches until it's nearly clear. If Depending on the material, so for instance acrylic, you can also use flame polishing. But the main thing we need to remember about plastics is in fact that they are self-finishing. That is the term that is used. Most plastics don't really need anything doing to them. That's the beauty of using plastics. And you could print onto it, such as with flexography, for instance, to make this little laptop decal here. So what did we learn today? In summary, we learned some of the main school plastic processes, which include laser cutting, line bending, vacuum forming, and 3D printing. And we learned about some commercial processes, including injection molding, extrusion molding, blow molding, and plastic welding. It's in both cases, school and uh, commercially, there's also ways to join and finishing. OK, well done, guys, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.